talked uh, about sums of squares, convex optimization approaches to Lyapunov functions last time. Um, there's actually a lot more to say in that direction, and we will come back to it. But I want to offer um, a different topic today, trajectory optimization. Strategically, I'm trying to sort of bracket what I think are maybe the right solutions that are going to take you really far in, uh, in robotics. So, so as I start today, I, I think it's time to maybe just step back for a second and think about the big picture of, of what algorithms we've talked about, why we've talked about them, where they're going to work, just for a minute. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so... We talked about dynamic programming, right? That was sort of the first algorithm we dug into. Very general, very powerful. Um, the system could be linear, nonlinear, you name it. It could have, it could be polynomial. It didn't have to be polynomial. It could be pretty much anything. We exploited additive cost, but that was, I mean, that was a pretty reasonable assumption. <clears throat> But our solution techniques either, you know, did a, were based on a mesh, which sort of fundamentally you can only do in a handful of dimensions, right? When we did that, we had very strong guarantees. We'd ex we had some knowledge about the, the, the iterations would converge, so we had, you know, a, a, a very satisfying algorithm, apart from discretization errors. When we talked about function approximation, most of those guarantees go away, except for special cases. This, you would think, would scale to higher dimensions, and it, do, it does scale a bit, but somehow you still have to evaluate, it, evaluate your dynamic programming update at sufficiently dense samples um, in order to propagate it back. Even if you're representing your function with function approximators, you know, the dynamic programming approaches feel sort of stuck in low dimensions. Um, in practice, you know, this isn't the way, we'll, we'll get back to the, you know, full-on function approximator when we talk about reinforcement learning, which is sort of a, a very approximate dynamic programming. But the global dynamic programming view feels like it's kind of stuck in low dimensions, right? We talked about LQR, linear quadratic regulators. That one, um, <clears throat> that could scale arbitrarily, really. Uh, yeah. At some point, you might have trouble solving the Riccati equation, but yeah, scales basically as, as high as you want. The limitation there, of course, though, was that you had to linearize your system. It doesn't have to be a linear system, but if you linearize around a fixed point of a nonlinear system, the linearization is only valid over some region, probably, right? brought in the idea of, of Lyapunov functions as a way to sort of soften the requirements. In both of these cases, we were looking for the optimal controller. And I, was, I tried to paint a picture that that's actually a pretty hard thing to ask for. The optimal control can be pretty complicated. So the idea was, let's loosen that requirement a little bit. If we just want the robot to not fall down, or just to get to the goal, then we could ask for less. We could just ask for stability. And that opened up Another class of algorithms, uh, you know, the algorithmic approach we took was with semi-definite programming in the simple case and sums of squares. SDP and sums of squares, okay. We didn't really talk about how well that scales, but it scales pretty well, right? You know, the key idea there, the really clever thing there, I think, is that it took the idea of trying to evaluate something at a bunch of sample points, and sample points just don't scale to really, really high dimensions. Um, 
and it, we found ways that we could write it for all x. And that does fundamentally scale better, okay? Um, <clears throat> in practice, you know, I think tens of dimensions are fine for this. I've seen it, you know, a few years ago when we were trying to say, what's the highest dimensional system we could stabilize? We got Atlas balancing on its toes. It was like 36 dimensions once you locked a few joints out. And so I've seen 36. You know, I, I bet today, just by the fact that our computers got faster, it could be, you know, a little bit bigger than that. But it's not like thousands that you could easily do in OQR, but it's pretty, you know, pretty awesome. <clears throat> It doesn't, what we didn't talk about there was uh, control design yet. We just talked about stabilization so far. You know, this was, let's, um, you know, proving stability, which I would call analysis, but so far, not synthesis. We weren't actually making the controller design. We were synthesizing new controllers. We can within reason, <clears throat> but there is a challenge that comes up, right? So the fundamental idea here was we were gonna guess a Lyapunov function that had some reasonably tractable form, like polynomials or something, you know, some nice smooth function that we could say something about for all x. If you remember, like the swing up task for the, that we computed with dynamic programming for the pendulum, cart pole, whatever, that has huge discontinuities in the, in the optimal policy, right? There's a state right here where I might go this way and a state right next to it goes this way. So if I try to represent my optimal controller in simple functions, I don't know if I can, right? So for control design, this, the, the tools work and we'll show you know, to some extent, it's, it's now a non-convex, you do iterations, but alternations, but, um, but you know, the math sort of works out. The idea of going for all x does work out. But it's somehow limited so far to being simple functions. And I'm not convinced that my controller is simple, okay? Kind of, that's, that, that's maybe too much because I think there's more work to do here, but. And simple could, doesn't actually mean, I mean simple is a hard thing to define, but somehow smoothness and easy to analyze, has quadratic forms. Right, so, so that's why I kind of focused on the Lyapunov case first, because there are many Lyapunov functions often that, and even simple Lyapunov functions that can prove stability about pretty complex systems. You might also think that there's many controllers, and maybe there are, but oftentimes the ones we want to come out are not that simple. So for instance, I showed sums of squares decide, coming up with a global proof of the stable, stability of the, of the pendulum for the nonlinear system going to the bottom. Okay. I thought that's pretty cool. I guess when I say it like that, it doesn't sound that cool. But uh, um, you know, I still think that's pretty amazing that it comes up with that and it's globally good and it's from an optimization that feels very non-convex, but it pff, comes out with the right thing. But if I were to ask it to now design a controller to stabilize the top, I didn't show you that example. And in fact, I don't know, I mean, we have the energy shaping thing, but if I have torque limits, I don't actually know a simple to represent function that stabilizes that nicely. So we haven't, not to say we couldn't, but we, have to, you know, we haven't actually had that come out of sums of squares yet. All right. <clears throat> All right, so philosophically, our goal is to get to more complicated systems, which often means higher dimensional systems, right? This feels like the right solution to some extent. The other thing I don't like about it is that it's full state feedback, but we'll talk more about that later. Okay, but low, you know, it's low dimensional. This is large but linear. This is somehow trying to take that idea of what we can do with linear systems and push it towards nonlinear systems with the idea of saying something for all x. <clears throat> and it, it is a fundamental approach to scaling to high dimensions. But it's still somehow, it, you know, it feels like a little bit more than we should expect. Um, you know, saying something about for all x in high dimensions, at some point that's just gonna get hard, right? For, and it's maybe more than we really need to solve. My, you know, as a multi-link system, 
I find myself, um, you know, my state space is very, very large, right? Especially if you look at all the wire, you know, the, the musculature or whatever in, inside, I've got a really big state space. I don't find myself having enough time in this lifetime to visit very much of that state space, right? There's a bunch of states I'll never visit. All right, so somehow saying for all X, that's more than I care about. There's a bunch of, I mean, okay, I started doing yoga recently and, <laughs> and I got a few new states in there. And I think I even found a few states that I'm sure I used to visit, but I can't visit anymore. I didn't even realize when that happened. But in general, it's still a very, very small subset of like the full state space, right? So somehow, you know, there's configurations that just are irrelevant. So. Maybe the fundamental way we have to scale is to ask for the right states. And it doesn't, it's not necessarily, you know, all of X1 and a little bit of X2. It's probably more complicated than that. There's some relevant set of states that describe my happiness when I'm alive um, that are relevant, you know, my relevant states. And that should be more tractable than all X, for all X. We don't really have a great way to, to talk about that. Not, not yet in the class, for sure, and maybe not in the world yet. But that's what I think we have to think about, right? So, like I said, I kind of want to bracket the two solutions. Um, for all X is beautiful and good, and I, I would love to get to the point where we could do for all X for a humanoid robot. But since we're not there yet, the, the other sort of fundamental attack that we can start chipping away at on how do you scale the high dimensions is to look at single solutions of the dynamical system, okay? The other extreme sort of, and really, I think it is a fundamental attack on the dimensionality is to consider, for now, today, for a moment, just one initial condition. So if I, I'm going to change, we're going to try to change our mindset, unfortunately, from thinking about functions over the entire state space to thinking about trajectories that go through the state space, okay? Um, and it turns out, if you can do that well, you can do a lot of things. And the same way, I mean, just to, to, to think about, you know, so just so you don't hate this right off the bat, if, if I can say something about a particular solution, then maybe there's hope of saying things about a neighborhood of solutions around that solution, just like we did, a, a, you know, to stabilize a fixed point. Maybe we can stabilize a trajectory, right? Or we could talk about an ensemble of points that are nearby. There's, all, there's ways to make this have a little bit more chops. But really the fundamental idea is, instead of trying to come up with the policy, the controller that was, you know, globally good for all X, you know, for instance, in the double integrator, I'm going to say, if my initial conditions are here, what I care about right now is this one trajectory. And if I can find that one trajectory, then you know I can already execute, given, given I started right here. And maybe I can even execute pretty well if I started nearby. Okay? <clears throat> and the, the, the reason I think that's a fundamental idea is because it really does provide focus for the, for the algorithm, it doesn't have to worry about all x in all dimensions or whatever. Really, no matter how high dimensional the system is, it's, we're just talking about a line, right? And that scales very well to higher dimensions, okay? Sure, maybe the coordinates that define the line go up linearly with dimension. That's totally different than having an exponential blow up in dimension, okay? So, so these approaches, are a fundamental attack on the curse of dimensionality. But they are going to be restricted too because you're only gonna be able to do so well if you, if you never look at the rest of the world, at what the rest of the world could do for you.
Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So let's dig in a little bit and see how do we, what our optimization problems start looking like if we zoom in and try to solve for just a single initial condition. So if I have some system, x dot equals f of x, u, I'd like to somehow minimize over some finite duration my inputs, my, both my state and my input is just now going to be a trajectory over time. Okay. Now it really does make sense to talk about a finite time because my I want to think about solutions that would be the simulation of this for some finite uh, simulation. Otherwise, it looks identical to what we had before. Another big difference here is that I'm going to do, I mean, I already had the x dot equals f of x u as a constraint to define that problem. But I'm going to say specifically that the initial conditions are known and they're pinned down to be x, some, some constant x naught. Okay, I can add other constraints too. I could add, um, you know, for all t, u of t is less than one, or um, that my, I could put, don't collide with the world. How, you know, it's interesting to think about how you'd write a don't collide with the world. You could say the sine distance function, which would be a function of x. Let's say if you look at um, x and you look at my robot's geometry and the world's geometry, you could compute a distance function between that. Typically, we call a sine distance function that's positive and negative. Maybe you say the sine distance function of x is always greater than or equal to zero, for instance. That would be like a no collision. We'll, we'll, we'll see that in more detail later. Okay, you can list a bunch of constraints like this. But the fundamental idea is that you're listing them on a single solution, x of t. And that solution is defined by it's the initial condition, the dynamics, and then your current decision variables, u. Right? That's the result of simulating things out, and I'm going to try to pick the u, which minimizes this cost subject to those constraints. Okay, I don't actually know how to optimize this in the current form. This is, I've written this as completely continuous. This, my decision variables here, u would be a, a function over time, even though it's a function of just one variable time. Um, I don't know how to write that down. So to make it an optimization, we need to make some finite parameterization of that. Now we're in the value iteration stuff we discretized over space. Here, we're gonna end up discretizing over time, right? Which is nice actually because I sort of complained that at least I don't know enough about PDE, discretization, uh, numerical analysis and stuff to put bounds on my discretization error. I think people do know. Um, but actually, you know, lots of people know about how to put bounds on integration error along a single trajectory. And the numerical analysis of, of integrators is actually pretty, pretty mature and I, I understand that. So, so we can, the, the discretization here is easier to think about and can be done more rigorously. Uh, but it's even sim so simpler still if we just go out and start with a discrete time system. We don't even have to think about that at all. So let's, let's start with a discrete time case. And in fact, it's important, let's, let's even start with a discrete time linear case. So.
Okay. So how can we write that down is the first question. Um, how do we hand that to an optimization engine and what sort of complexity does it, do we get out? Do we get a convex optimization? Do we get a semi-definite optimization? Do we get a sums of squares optimization? Right? There's all these um, hierarchies. Is it a linear program? Is it a quadratic program? Okay, so there's a, there's a bunch of choices. Even in this most sort of simple example, you still have a few modeling choices about how you're going to write the optimization problem down. Um, which are, they're called transcriptions of this optimization problem into a numerical recipe, basically. Transcriptions, transcribe. Okay, so um, one of the ones that I like the best for various reasons are uh, are to just to keep it almost exactly what I've written here. Let me go ahead and write it out here. But somehow, um, you know, there's this isn't quite something I could hand to a solver because I haven't defined x completely, right? But the first thing I could do, for instance, is to um, add x as extra decision variables, okay? Same way we, when we added a sums of squares constraint or, an S, or the PSD constraint, whatever, we, we, we made some new decision variables for that matrix. We added them to the program. They weren't really the thing we were solving for, just extra decision variables that helped us write the problem down. Um, you know, in general, those are called slack variables. Typically. <clears throat> okay, so if we were to add x um, as extra decision variables, then now, actually, I could type this into a solver right away. I'm going to try to find x and u simultaneously, which minimizes some long-term cost. But those are just a function of the decision variable, so I can evaluate that easily. And this is just a, a constraint on the decision variables. right? And this is just a constraint on the decision variables. In fact, if we were to take, for instance, and use our LQR cost, then what type of optimization problem do we have here? It's convex, yep. And the constraints are linear. They're all linear in the decision variables. And this is a quadratic objective. So this would be a quadratic program. This is a quadratic program that you probably shouldn't write because LQR already gave you a closed form solution to this globally, so you didn't actually need that one. But again, maybe oftentimes if you can find a way to write the same problem in optimization, you might be able to do a little bit more than you could do in the closed form. So for instance, what, what could we do here that we couldn't do with the LQR derivation? Yeah, I could start throwing in extra constraints on x and u. Some of them are going to be convex and some of them are not, but I can put convex constraints on x and u. For instance, if I were to say, you know, something like this, I couldn't do that in my Riccati equation solution, but I can do that in this solution. Okay? 
So I could still solve a quadratic program, find now the optimal solution trajectory given the constrained quadratic regulator. Right? Similarly, I could put some constraints on x. If I, if I said, for instance, my cart pole, remember I said that you don't want the cart pole to go outside of the rail. Um, so you could say like, for all x, for all n, sorry, um, x, let's say is, that's a good, that's a perfectly good convex constraint on x. It's a linear constraint, two linear constraints, right? And uh, so that's still a quadratic program. And so I should say that like quadratic programs, not only can you solve them and they're numerically robust or whatever, uh, and they always go to a global optima, they're also really fast. Like we can, we solve, you know, while Atlas is balancing, we solve big quadratic programs constantly while it's walking at 200, well, it was, a, it was kind of fun, right? So, so first we were solving them at 200 hertz and the robot was a little bit wonky and then we got it up to like 400 hertz and then the robot walked beautifully. Okay, and uh, it got to the point that there was one there was one special case that if a foot hit too hard, basically it could surprise our our QP solver and it would take longer to solve, and uh, so you'd see like a drop in the in the frame rate, and uh, the robot would just, like shake because the solver took like twice as long in that particular case, and it, and we figured out how to get around that. But if that had ever happened sort of at the end, we could have like fallen down because our QP controller took too long. But my point is actually that QPs you can solve really fast online. Um, and people do it all the time these days. <clears throat> okay, so that's an interesting thing to know. This is trajectory optimization for linear systems under linear constraints. This is a way to transcribe it by making x decision variables. Okay, you can solve it as a quadratic form. It's not surprising that it's convex, considering we could solve it with a closed form, but it's cool because we could add more variables and more constraints. So why are we adding x as an expert system variable? I mean, if you have the initial condition and you have the system, and you simulate the system and express everything as functional. Of awesome question. Did everybody understand that question? It feels excessive to put x in as a decision variable because I could actually write, there's another idea, idea number two, let's call it, uh, just solve xn as a function of x0 and u0, uh, u1 up to u n minus 1, right? So I could roll that out and in, my, in the thing I hand the solver, I don't actually even need to add xn as a variable because x0 is x0, x1 is a x0 plus b u0, right? x2 is a of this. Okay, you can do that as far as you want. You can roll that all the way out and it's still gonna be linear in the control. And you can add that to the solver. There is a reason why I still prefer this in, in addition to like it being less work to type in. Do you have any guesses? Well, first, do people understand that approach is that you don't actually have, you could just, once x0 and, and u is defined as my decision variables, I can simulate the thing forward so I can evaluate my cost without extra decision variables. And in this case, it's still, it would still be a convex constraint, a linear constraint. The only difference really is that is the way that you present that to the solver. So sometimes some solvers excel at giving many small, this, these are sparse constraints. So every individual constraint only touches a few decision variables. Some solvers can exploit that there's a banded sparsity pattern that happens to that. And the factorizations and everything they do on the inside, it can be faster, even though it has more decision variables. Um, you know, as, whereas this gives a dense constraint across the, and uh, you know, this particular one, I think solvers handle pretty well. But in general, when you get to more nonlinear things, a lot of times this, this more direct transcription uh, can be better. 
It's also easier to add constraints like this because it's just a it's just a simple function of my only my decision variables here. Whereas I would have to put copy this whole thing over in every time for every n into this. So for the modeling power, I also like that one. Yes. Um, so you mentioned the algebraic trees before, and I guess I'm a, I'm a bit turned around what algebra I use here because in closed form algebra, it's minimizing. We choose u to minimize a quadratic cost, but here we're using x and u to minimize some quadratic cost. So is this the algebraic trees that are minimizing along? We haven't really done LQR trees yet. That was a preview that I didn't mean to confuse you with. Um, so for, let's, let's, we've talked about LQR. Let's, let's, we'll come back to LQR trees in a bit. But this is still, this is like one branch. This is like an LQR bind, if you want, or something. Um, so, and it's, it's, this is even just the nominal trajectory. So if I have, um, you know, my quadrotor stabilizing at the top, and I want to find a whole family of solutions that are going to get here. This is just examining that in one one solution, right? To get me to the back to the goal. Um, adding the x as a decision variable is just a way to hand it to the solver. It's like on the algebra you're doing on the paper. I did, I made as extra variable to make the algebra go through the fr the formulation I wanted to, to solve is that one, or wherever it went. Yeah, that one, right? It's just minimizing over u. X is only a helper to help me type it into the solver. Mm -hmm. This one we tend to call direct transcription. This one where you roll it out, that rolling it out is called a shooting method. So these are typically a direct shooting method, but I often just call it shooting method. So, yeah, the, the various ways that you can choose to encode your problem and hand it to the solver often have different names. Okay? Which one is better? So, there's, there's a right answer in, in the linear case. And when you get to the nonlinear case, there's two camps, right? And we talk to each other and we're friends, but we disagree fundamentally in these, in, in these ways. Um, and uh, what's that? <laughs> I know, I'm a transcriber, I'm a direct transcriber. Um, the reason is because I think the sparsity helps and I can put constraints on here um, really easily, okay? Um, there are other people that, that, that do a lot of shooting methods, um, right? So. It's not just that, have you ever heard of the tail wagging the dog problem? Uh, it's kind of a weird analogy, but um, so, so one of the problems with this is if you think about the gradients that come out of this, uh, it, they're very uneven, okay? So if you were to do a, a gradient-based optimization to try to minimize U, U0 has a big impact on your total cost. If I change U0 a little bit, my cost can change a lot. U at time 32 has significantly less cost, uh, less, less chance to affect my total cost, okay? So your, whatever solver you have to deal with has to deal with this sort of very weighted gradient, that's, okay? This is a more, this doesn't show that, it, of course the problem still has those characteristics, but somehow all the gradients of all the constraints here are more even. So it's just, I think they're numerically conditioned better. Yeah, correct. Well, it depends. I mean, it's this is the state space need not be your control space, right? It's it's adding big N times the number of states, and this one is big N times the number of inputs. Before, it's true. It's many more decision variables. Okay, so um, it's a good exercise to think about the different modeling power that you have in this space to still think about what would be a convex optimization. Um, I, I give a, you know, I'll give a few examples, but um, you know, in general, so quadratic is one big one. If you had a linear objective, that's another case, that would be a linear program, right? Um, so, so actually that, that can be fine if you just wanted to like minimize the absolute value of x. If you said, minimize, um, you could do x, u in this case, 
the sum of the absolute values of x in an L1 norm, let's say, like, like actually element-wise maximum or absolute values, that is also, that's a linear program now. That's a convex optimization. Okay. Um, there's, a various, there's various things you can encode that stay convex. And that's like a, that's the playbook kind of idea where you just, as you do these more and you write more problems, you will find more ways to encode things that stay in the complexity class that we like. Actually, an interesting one. So if we wanted to do minimum time problem for the double integrator or for whatever, the lin double integrator is certainly linear. Could you do the minimum time problem as a convex optimization? How would you write that one? It's actually subtle. I think the best solution is not a, a single convex optimization, but um, what you could do is you can say find x dot u dot subject to my dynamics my initial condition and you can say that x of n has to be zero or whatever my goal is on x goal if you solve this for n then this is just a feasibility problem you solve it for any one n, that's a, that's a linear program in this case. But you can do a line search on n. So you can solve a small number of linear programs to find the solution. Because if once n is above the minimum time, it will always have a solution. So what you do is you pick an n. If it's said feasible, you make n smaller. You can do bisection bi search or whatever until you find the threshold, the smallest capital N for which this system is feasible. And that's typically the way you'd find a minimum time solution with convex optimization. Okay? It's good stuff. There's like lots of things you can you can encode. Okay. So, um we wouldn't, if we were to, if we were to solve this, find that optimal solution, and plot it on the double integrator, we'd still have one. So, how would the accuracy of that compare to our mesh-based stuff? Right. Our, our dynamic programming one. Remember, it actually had an offset on the switching surface because of the numerical bleeding. This one is actually going to be fairly accurate. The discretization is only in time, but there is a there is one nuisance, which is that. If, if my time step is, if I've got a discrete time system, it's not necessarily going to, you know, the continuous time solution doesn't necessarily land at a, at a particular, um, you know, some nice fr fraction of, of dt. Right. So let me say that better. In what order did I say that? Let's say I had x dot equals ax plus bu now, continuous time. The, the natural approximation that, that comes from this would be to, to make the discrete time approximation, you know, write the same problem I did there, but approximate xn plus 1 is xn plus some time step, dt, called delta t, um, times f of xn. And then you could start shifting dt around, and that would just be like your numerical integration along time. This would be like an, a forward Euler integration. Appro 
approximation. And just like we actually have a whole playbook of numerical recipes for integrating a differential equation over time, and understanding the accuracy of that, like the Euler integrator isn't particularly efficient, but at least it has the property that as dt goes to zero, the solution will be will approach the true continuous time solution. Um, but it might take a small dt to get good accuracy. It's got first order accuracy. You guys might know higher order integration routines. Those can pop in here too. Some of them bring in non-convexity. Okay, but we have good understanding of how the numerical tolerances of these things scale. In this particular solution, I'd expect you to say, wait, wait a second, we actually know the analytical, you could do e to the a delta t in this and, and get this one correct for some finite, because we, we don't have to numerically approximate the integral of a linear system. We could do that in closed form, and you can for sure. Um, so then there'd be no integration error except my minimum time solution would still be limited because it, it's only going to find a solution that lands at some fixed time step. And if the, the, the answer was, uh, you know, getting the time, the minimum time should have been 3.012 and I'm sampling with, at 0.1 steps, it's not going to give you the exact answer. It's going to give you a bang bang controller almost all the way to the end and then it's going to give you something you somewhere in the middle as it tries to slide into the goal. Okay? Right, so in general though, we can do this for nonlinear systems. Or higher order integration. Backwards Euler sometimes makes more sense. You know, they're all, all the suite, if you know the library of different integration, numerical integration routines, like in MATLAB, it's ODE 4.5 is, is the same as Runge-Kutta 4.5, fourth order, fifth order derivatives. So you can do all those kind of check techniques here. Actually, I guess you're doing ODE 4 when you type it in like this. <coughs> Does that make sense? All right, so let's think about that as an approximation. The forward Euler version there is effectively the same as me making some approximation of my solutions where I said I'm, you know, I have UT and I'm going to represent it with a fixed, with a controller that's in some step, basically, right? That it only, I pretend that U only changes at discrete intervals where this is delta T, delta T, delta T. This is like my U0, U1, U2, U3, U4. Right, by virtue of only adding the variables, the, the samples at these times, I'm constraining as if my, my control policy was constrained in this way. So you should think that the optimal solution is, if my optimal solution for the continuous time problem was some rich thing, it will do its best to approximate that, but it's limited in its library to these, um, the U being constrained over those time samples. So for instance, if you take an LQR, a, a continuous time LQR solution, even the closed form analytical one, and then you were to compare that to, you were to convert that into discrete time and ask for the discrete time, you'd see that the same initial condition for the discrete time system should have a higher cost than the system, the continuous time system because of that step, uh, you know, assumption that comes in. Okay. So this control you use in practice Well, um, there's there's different philosophies there too. So the fact is, I'm only going to send commands to my actuators at a finite sample. I've got a, I've got a sample data system that is actually my you know my implementation, unless I'm doing analog uh, 
computation, right? At some point, I actually do have a discrete clock. So maybe this is actually the more real representation of what I'm sending to the controller. Whether I'm, if I'm sending that at a kilohertz, I might not be able to solve my trajectory optimization at a kilohertz, in which case, you know, if, you know, maybe the continuous time is actually more faithful, but it's, uh, the real answer is somewhere in the middle, right? But that's a good question. By the way, there's an idea that we're going to come back to in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> we talked about this being a very local solution, but I also said that these quadratic programs can be solved lickety-split. So one of the ways that you can use this to make a more global solution is just to use this in a feedback loop. So if I start executing here, I solve my optimal controller, Okay, I execute exactly one time step. Let's say the wind blew and I ended up over here. If I can solve my optimal controller to global optimality every time I'm from every, initial, every state and I can solve it fast enough, then I actually have an on-demand sampling from the optimal feedback controller. Okay, That's called model predictive control and I'll say more about it later. Let's just solve trajectory optimization at every time step. Even if you're a linear, if you've got a linear system, the conventional understanding is that if your system is unconstrained, you should solve the Riccati equation and, uh, and use that. As soon as you have constraints, like input constraints, the right solution is to write down that QP and solve it fast enough and do model predictive control. And that's the way you can, that's the sort of accepted right way to solve, to control a constrained linear system. You can do model predictive control even when you have, um, this, you can, you can solve it on nonlinear trajectory optimization. Um, but what's the big difference when you have this, this formulation? Let's say I had xn plus 1 is, is some nonlinear function of xn un. What happens here? Say it again. Let's say I'm, I, so let's say I'm writing my optimization min u, I could do the x version or the not, sum over g of x u. Let's say this is even quadratic, I'll keep it quadratic. So, so this constraint, as soon as you have nonlinear dynamics, this potentially is a very non-convex constraint. Okay? So what's the, I mean, so people do do model predictive control uh, for nonlinear optimization. People even do that like on autonomous cars. Okay? But it's a little bit scary because <laughs> not only could it give you a local minima, it could just be like running along happily saying, yeah, turn left, turn right, and then Oops, infeasible, you know, and, and maybe there is a solution, but, uh, but I just didn't find it that time. And uh, yeah, maybe that's not so good for an autonomous car, I don't know, um, or a humanoid robot. We chose not to use that on the humanoid robot. We could solve beautiful plans to trajectory optimization to make the robot run, whatever, but the smallest chance of being like halfway through the air and said, like, oops, I can't find the solution, <laughs> that was just a no-go. We never did it in the competition. It's, that was just like... I'm not willing to, to run that controller. So, um, so convex versus non-convex in that in this space is the difference between I'm willing to run it on a robot and I'm not willing to run it on a robot. Yeah. So for the continuous case, uh, what's the case, so what's the definition of a convex optimization point you are minimizing a function like in the continuous So um, I'm only going to I'm only talking about the finite parameterization of the of the continuous time thing. So as I get to continuous time, I'm going to make some finite. Uh, 
approximation of that over time. And then we talk about the numerics or convexity of that. You can talk about convexity of a functional, but that's not what we need for numerical implementation, so. Okay. So that, let's, let's talk about that now. So how do I, if, as I go to more continuous time, so this is the, the once I go to continuous or nonlinear dynamics, I already potentially have a nonlinear optimization. Um, but let's make the branch, the, the trip now to continuous time. I still, in order to have a finite approximation, right, I want to minimize u of t. I need to come up with some finite parameterization of u and if, if I'm going to use x as a decision variable, I need to come up with some finite approximation of the, of the decision variables x, too. You can choose many approximations. You could use a step for u, a step for x, and that gives you an algorithm. That's perfectly good. But there does seem to be a sweet spot, at least for the camp that does the transcription like I do. The shooting methods matter less, actually. But, the, but if you're willing, if you want to do the transcription methods, okay, um, there's a sweet spot in terms of the number of parameters you use to parameterize your trajectory and the accuracy you get of your numerical integration, okay? And that um, comes up in the algorithm that's best known as direct collocation. That's a different use of the word collocated than in the partial feedback linearization. <clears throat> okay. And the sweet spot is I'm going to approximate x of t with a cubic spline. Okay. So it's a it's a piecewise polynomial. You have not points here, but it's going to actually, in each segment, be a cubic polynomial. X of t here is c0 plus c1 t plus c2 t squared plus c3 t3 and where actually that's relative to this, these not points. And then u of t is a first order spline. Otherwise known as a first order hold. So you have decision variables here, which are u0, u1, u2, and the like, okay? And then you just, if you want to evaluate the, the system in between, you can, it's just a linear interp interpolation. The reason that happens to be a sweet spot is there's this idea in indirect collocation, you can write down your optimization to completely define this spline, what you say is that um, at all ti, uh, x dot ti equals f of x t u of t. That's easy, or these are the not points. So you'd like this to have the slope at these points to be faithful to the dynamics. This is a good, if I can, if I have a spline representation of this, I can certainly make this true. And that mostly defines my, that defines the continuity equations of my spline, okay? 
But there's, if I wanna, I could still have this be true and lift this whole thing up and down. So I get to have a few more constraints on my spline. And the trick is that in between the spine, the, the knot points, you also ask for this co-location point to match the derivative. I'll call them T co-location. And this turns out to be, for a small number of function evaluations, you have a function evaluation at every knot point and at every co-location point, you get something that gives you numerical accuracy up to third order. And it turns out to be a simple thing to compute in terms of the parameters of the spline. Yes? Sorry, can you repeat what a co-location point is? No, it's fine. So for every, for every part of my spline, let me zoom in a little bit here. Let's say this is T13, T14. I have a piecewise polynomial defining that segment of, the tr of X. I'm gonna ask that at my sample times, I'd like the derivative to match the dynamics. I'd like this to be a faithful representation of the dynamics. I still have more degrees of freedom in my, in my spline, so I'm gonna pick one more point. It turns out it's easy to evaluate this part of a spline in a cubic spline. The, num the numbers work out very easily. And I'm gonna ask for this to also match, but I'm gonna evaluate the derivative of this and make it also match my uh, dynamics. And this, is the this is called the co-location points. So this is what I'm calling TC13. And are those the midpoint between? They're the midpoint in time. Okay. Yep. So the method of choice for me is direct co-location, where you use this approximation of the continuous time system using cubic splines here, first order splines here, I just got the most mileage out of this particular formulation, okay? It's very interesting to think about what this is doing as a new, I mean, you could do this if you wanted, instead of, you could never call ODE 4 or 5 again, right? This is just a different way to solve differential equations. Instead of, so, so it seems clever now in retrospect to, to like start at the beginning and then march one step at a time and solve your differential equation. That's, a, that's one way to do it, but we're doing something different here. We're writing down all of the solutions at the same time. The constraint, before the system is optimized, you know, before it has satisfied all these constraints, it might have, uh, it might look like this, right? It might have a representation that's like, well, 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 you know, right? This is my solution to the differential equation. Now, this, now the, it's just an initial guess, and maybe it's zeros everywhere, or maybe it's random, right? And what's the solver gonna do in order to integrate the trajectory? If U was fixed, all it would be doing would be going and trying to fight these things and push them together, and that's a way to integrate differential equations, okay? It's, it could say infeasible, which is probably not what you want out of an integration solver, but that's, I think that's a nice way to think about what the optimization is doing. Okay, so, the modeling power of this is really pretty good. Let me take a minute and uh, show you some examples. <clears throat> so direct co-location is uh, the recipe of choice, typically, but we've got all the other ones implemented too, for the most part. Some of them I haven't ported from MATLAB yet, but most, a lot of them are there. Um, you can, by the way, once you're in the land of nonlinear optimization, you can choose to even make where you put the, the, the sampling times as a decision variable. 
You could have it stretch or shrink over time. It's a non-convex thing again if you do that, but it's a, you, you have the flexibility to do that. So we do that by default, and you have to actually say, make them, at least keep them equal. That's an extra constraint, just to say keep the um, constraints equally timed. You don't always want that, but it's a good thing to add. We say add a constraint to all of the points to say that the torque that the U is is within the torque limit. I said I say the initial state of the pendulum is at zero zero. By the way, as soon as we land a feature in NumPy, we're going to have that version. Okay, um, NumPy doesn't like our stuff, but um, okay. The final state is at the top. So we say add a, add a constraint at the top. A bounding box constraint is just one that has a lower bound and an upper bound simultaneously. That's just a name for just saying I'm going to bracket a decision variable by a simple less than or equal to. Okay? Ask questions if you, don't, if you want help parsing this. I'm going to add a running cost. So this is my g of x. All I've added here is just u transpose ru. Okay? So I added a final value constraint here, so I don't actually need to add a, a cost on x. The formulation is start at the bottom, end at the top, and in between use as little torque as you can. As you can. Okay? And then you basically call solve, and you plot the solution. All right? So. That finds a solution that pumps up the pendulum and to the top. Yeah. At, uh, in the running cost, you you just have r times u of zero squared. I was wondering how how can you get away with just the initial just squaring the initial u for your running? Cost? I don't have that. Um, oh, sorry. It looks. Uh -huh. Good. So, but u here is. Um, is the is the input so it's actually the zeroth element? It's not the zeroth time. Oh, uh, it's it's just the way the numpy thing works. Yes, so that is an array that is, and since there's only one actuator, got it. Yeah, so that's just the first actuator. Good call. All right, so that finds a solution that swings up the torque limited pendulum to the top in a single trajectory. Now it's interesting and it's important to remember that this is not necessarily a global optimizer, right? So if I say, for instance, take as much time as you want, let's say I could, I have its maximum time be considerably more. If I can find my solver again. I might get a very different solution, right? So that's not the optimal solution, but it's a local optimal solution. And it's actually very hard for a solver that's doing pretty well getting to the top like this to stop and figure out that there's, you know, you're going to have to incur more costs or not satisfy that final constraint in order to go from the, you know, four pump solution to a two pump solution. And that's this like, that's exactly the non convexity of the landscape. Does that make sense? Right? So if I have one trajectory. If I were to plot, somehow plot my cost. Versus my x's or my u's, my decision variables here. And I'm getting some cost for my three pump trajectory. It might be that there's a better solution here with two pumps. with a different set of parameters. But in order to get there, I have to do worse before I can get better. Okay, so there's, this problem is fraught with local minima. You can give it initial guesses to put it in the vicinity of the, a solution like that, but those are going to be hard. Yes? But then you can get over that by doing a line search over the max time. In low dimensions, you can. Okay. Right, so behind the scenes, so in mathematical program in Drake, we just line up. So there's something that I worked really hard to do. I hope I don't know if you guys would ever appreciate it. But, but uh, it is the case that if you write that same code and you hand it to a linear system 
and you go through and you only have linear constraints, then it'll call it Gorobi, right? It figures out that you have an LP or a QP. But if you added a pendulum, it goes through and it calls a different solver, it calls snot. Because it's always looking at the constraints you're adding, it's figuring out what complexity class it is and calls the right solver. That was really hard, but, it, but I, I, I think it matters, I don't know. Um, okay, so, so when it calls snopped, what's it doing? So snopped is a different solver. It's a sparse nonlinear optimization solver, okay? Um, snopped takes an initial guess like this. Let's say this is my, my parameters of my optimization, and this is my cost, which is a function of alpha, okay? What it does is it's called sequential quadratic programming. This one's a particularly good one that's sparse. And you don't have to know the details, but you should know the intuition, which is that what you can do is right here, you take the gradients and even the second derivative, you make a local quadratic approximation of that cost function you pretend it's a QP, you solve it to optimality. Now you have this as an initial guess, you make a new approximation like this, you solve it to optimality, and this has a, this has a second order convergence to a local optima. An alternative is just to do first order gradient descent where you take the derivative and you go downhill, but that can take longer to get to the same local minima, okay? So snopped is a second order method that goes bam, bam, bam and handles constraints. But it can get stuck in local minimum. Sorry I had that thing going for so long here. All right, so the cool thing is this is a general solution approach. You could take ex almost exactly the same code, put it in the code for the, um, for the cart pole. Now the cart pole's state is four dimensions, so instead I just plotted the input trajectory, okay? But it swings up and, and it finds a path that swings up and gets to the top for the cart pole, okay? Same code, pre pretty much. I mean, I right, I had to call cart pole instead of pendulum, and my final state was four dimensional instead of two dimensional. The cost function is the same; it's all good, okay? And um, my other favorite example here is to do the same thing for the Acrobat. This is how, remember I promised before that optimal control would be able to do good things to get the Acrobat to the top. And that's it, just like that, boom. Now here's the thing, okay, and I, I full disclosure, right? So, you know, Snopped is this awesome package that's written by people, um, academics at UCSD, um, you know, they're, they're doing research with it, they're supporting it. Yeah. Anyways, they upgraded their version, they have a new solver, and it's probably better for almost everybody in the world. But it made my Acrobat worse, right? Like, like I, if I upgrade from SNOP 7.4 to SNOP 7.6, my Acrobat takes like twice as long to get up, or sometimes it doesn't even get up, right? And that's just really, like, if that was an autonomous car, that would be really bad, right? Uh, you know, you don't want to be on the verge of like, maybe I, I'm gonna get it, maybe I'm not gonna get it. If that's a humanoid robot, maybe not, okay? Um, but, the tools are pretty, are pretty good. Um, it's to the point where you get to, if you want to find good solutions, then a little bit of initial guessing, and it's often cost function tweaking, and this is the difference between the, the people who do the shooting methods and the, I try not to talk, tweak my cost function a lot. Anyways, um, that's what we argue about at the meetings, right? Okay, so, but, um, you know, it mostly works, and, and that is, I have said, so when we've done final projects in this class before, a lot of people choose to use trajectory optimization, and they come up with a clever tool, or a clever robot that they want to balance or do something crazy, and the success rate is very high. If you apply this to some new system that you care about, you will probably get a good video out. Okay? Um, that's my, been my experience. And we really do use this stuff uh, on Atlas, so even when we're just reaching for, uh, you know, just to solve the inverse kinematics problem, we actually, most people think that's a closed form solution or whatever, but it's actually much more general to solve that as optimization. So I, even for the posture, the kinematics, we actually do that by 
just saying, here's a quadratic cost. Find the Q, which is as close as possible to desired. Subject to constraints, like my end effector is in a certain place. My joint limits are, uh, you know, are satisfied. My collision avoidance, I don't want my elbow to be in the table. My feet should stay put, whatever. And we can solve that at real time rates. And that's how we figure, that's how we would move Atlas around. It would be by solving a, a SQP. Solved with SQP. Um, you know, SQP methods work better if you give them analytical gradients. And a lot of the work, we've done a lot of work in Drake to make sure that we can give solvers op analytical gradients um, and sparsity and other things like that. And at the time, that was, this is a while ago now, we were solving it at 100 hertz. It's, it's way faster now. Okay, so it does occasionally say infeasible, and that's really annoying. But, uh, but it, you know, it mostly worked. And we, this, was, this was my joke in the DARPA challenge. So they, they, the, the DARPA challenge, they gave us this 400 pound humanoid. Or we won the 400 pound humanoid by doing well in a simulation challenge, right? So we get this 400 pound humanoid and they're, they're thinking up challenges that we're, they're gonna make us do with this 400 pound humanoid we're trying to, okay. And they say, okay, you're, you're gonna drive a car. I'm like, that's great. And then they gave us this little Polaris, okay, that the robot doesn't fit in the car, right? So they actually could not sit behind the steering wheel. So we ended up using our optimization engine to figure out how to fit the robot into the car, right? Um, and the answer in the end was that the robot has to straddle the console. Um, it drives with its left foot and its hand on the steering column, and then it has to get out by going out the, the passenger door. And that was the only way we could make it work. Okay, so you know, having optimization can help you fit big robots in little cars. Um, and then the way we would do motion planning on Atlas was just turning that into a spline. So solving the same problem as a trajectory optimization, where now the, motion, the joint, joints over time were a spline. And then we would add constraints that say, don't put this cinder block inside that cinder, or sorry, that uh, balsa wood, piece of wood inside the other balsa wood, and we'd fall, we'd solve it with SQP. So that works. It's solved in seconds. But we weren't willing to run it when the robot was running. So when the robot was standing still and picking things up, if it said infeasible, we'd say, yeah, okay, we'll try something else, you know? Uh, but if the robot was walking and, and like was in midair, then we didn't, we were never willing to call SQP. Um, you know, and this works for, for quad rotors too. So we used to fly quad rotors through obstacles. It's, um, it's a local method. Right? This is a classic example of a non-convex constraint, is if I have an airplane or a quadrotor, right? Let me draw world's cheesiest airplane. Okay, so, and I have a polygonal tree, right? Which is really easy to code in optimization, right? That's why we have a square force. Um, then the decision about going this way or this way around the tree is like a classic example of a non-convex constraint. X is feasible here, it's feasible over here, but it's not feasible for solutions in between it. So as soon as you have obstacles, you tend to get into the world of non-convex optimization. Yeah? Okay, so, um, there is a question you should ask yourself, and I'll, I'll just sort of end with this, we'll, we'll go on to stabilization in the next lecture. Um, so, you can get to the point where you have a cool robot, and if you guess a good initial condition, or if you run your optimization enough times from random initial conditions, your trajectory optimization might fail, 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 succeed, and the video that you get when you make that success looks awesome, right? And then you can put it on YouTube, and you can say, I've solved the problem. <laughs> Don't do that. People do that nowadays, and it's really annoying. Um, not everybody does that, but a lot of people do that. And it, I think it confuses everybody. So like, I, I feel really torn about this. This is my, I actually wrote down, if you say this, admit that you're a grumpy old man. Because it's like my grumpy old man comment. But, um, but don't do that. You know, so, so like, it's still good. Like, it's, you found a solution to the problem. The, I would not consider that a, you solved the problem, right? And, and you should fully disclose how well it worked, <laughs> I think, when you, write, when you put your YouTube video up. Um, like for that, for instance, it works pretty well. Every once in a while, I'll just say I can't find a path, right? Okay, good. Uh, last detail is that we do have an, a midterm coming up next week, okay? It's in class next Tuesday. Uh, 
I, we will ask a few questions about trajectory optimization, which is, you know, I expect you to have understood what we talked about in class, but I understand that you won't have a problem set due on that beforehand. Okay. Um, we're going to post a few exams from the previous years so you know what they're like, but it's just an in-class um, in class exam right here during the normal time, and uh, you're, I'm happy to have you bring in two sheets front and back. You know, it's not supposed to be an exercise in writing small, but you know, you're welcome to use notes. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions about that, we can talk in Piazza or, or whatever, but we'll post some practice exams um, today or tomorrow. Cool, I will see you on Thursday.